Hi, folks. Welcome to the Wine Foundry in Napa Valley, California. We are a uh, family-owned boutique winery, and uh, we are here showcasing uh, two of our brands, Anarchist Wine Co. and Foundry Wines. As we'll get into this a bit more, uh, you'll understand Anarchist Wine Co. is centered around really unconventional blends, and uh, our winemaker, Patrick, on the screen, it's his... Uh, his playground, so to speak. He gets to have a lot of fun and, and kind of buck convention. Foundry Wines is your more, uh, I'd say more traditional uh, varietal designates. And uh, today we're gonna be focused on one of our blends for that. So there's a lot of new people on here. We, we'll try not to repeat too many things as we get into this, um, but did wanna bring a few people up to speed there. Um, so, with this, I am Steve Ryan. I'm the general manager, as Stuart uh, mentioned earlier in the, in the preamble. I've got my two uh, good friends and colleagues, our director of winemaking, Patrick Sabo, and uh, our great guy. He has a lot of titles, wears a lot of hats, not just because he doesn't have any hair. Uh, Stuart Ake. Oh, sorry, Stu. And uh, so Whoa. Stu is our uh, director of accounts um, at the Wine Foundry and for the brands. He's also our wine educator. We call him the wine guru and, and one of the kindest souls you'll ever meet. Um, getting into this session, just to run through a quick little kind of uh, few items of note, by, by the end of the session, we're hoping you have the following, uh, an understanding of the role of blending and the importance of it in creating a finished wine. Um, in particular, we're gonna get into how there's even just, I think, 2% of a varietal in one of these wines, and it, and it does definitely play its role uh, very loud. Um, we are going to do a bit of uh, insight into what goes into creating a brand. A little later, we're going to bring on a special guest. Our uh, designer, Jenny Dahl, is going to join us, and she's going to talk a bit about what went into the packaging and label design and, and kind of show you a bit of behind the scenes things there and a little insight into taking a fresh approach into honoring winemaking traditions and maintaining those uh, philosophies, but really kind of taking a different spin and getting you inside the mind of Patrick Sabo, which is a fun ride for sure. So buckle up. We also hope you have a bit of fun. Tonight we're gonna open up uh, two bottles, which hopefully you've already opened. The 2018 The Anarchist, our flagship white for the brand Anarchist Wine Co. And the other is the 2013 Foundry Wines, The Crucible, a right bank inspired blend. So with that, I'm um, excited that so many of you ordered the uh, four packs and two packs for this tasting. And for those that, that maybe don't have these wines in front of you, open up anything you can find, whether it's wine, beer, tequila, whatever it is, um, kick back, relax, hopefully have a good time. And um, if you have not opened the Crucible yet, definitely do. It needs a little bit of time to breathe and start working in the glass. Without repeating too much of what we've gone over in uh, prior weeks, I'm not going to tell you how to taste wine again because we've covered that, but just really swirl it in the glass, get some oxygen aerating through there, get your nose deep in the glass, and whew, that's good. Uh, so with, without further ado, um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to, uh, to Stuart. Stuart, you hey. want to talk in? Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Steve, and thanks for calling me Stuart. It's, it's, uh, it's about time we, you know, like a little more formality here. Hey, uh, I've been looking forward to the anarchist session for a while because this is the wine that started it all for us. This is the genesis of the anarchist brand. Going back to the days of yore, way back to 2015, um, Patrick kind of went like this a little bit. He was, he was thinking and, and he approached uh, the staff and he's like, hey, I, 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 wanna, I wanna try something new. And he, he really kind of laid out this idea that he's like, look, it's beautiful that we have convention. I love following um, the, the, the paths that have been laid out by, from winemakers before me, but I wanna break things. I wanna, I wanna create new traditions. And we, we kind of talked about it and, he, and then the, the beautiful thing is that he had a vision for this wine. And, and so I just wanted, before we even really get started, I want to toast Patrick Sabo for, uh, mm -hmm. for kind of introducing us to a new approaches to winemaking. So cheers, Patrick. Cheers, Stuart. And you know, when you have all these grapes together, it would be easy to think it's just a mishmash. 
And, uh, and, but that wasn't the approach. I, I often think about it like jazz musicians in the late 50s with the free jazz movement. You know, they were breaking modes. They were breaking scales, uh, kind of reinterpreting them. And then there was lousy players who made in and just made noise. This is not noise. And the big grape that we're using in here tonight, Gewurztraminer. Patrick, you want to kind of talk about, like, we have Gewurztraminer. We think about it as usually interpreted as like a sweet wine. I often hear it's a sweet wine. We know that all grapes are sweet. Take it away, Patrick. Kind of tell us about what happened here. Well, I am a huge uh, fan of the wines from the Alsace region in France. And so that's the Eastern, that's the, the side of where it borders Germany and on both sides of the border, they make beautiful white wines particularly. And the, there's a number of varieties that they use there, including Gewurztraminer and Pinot Gris or Pinot Blanc and Riesling. And, and uh, so they make beautiful wines from that area. And I, I'm a huge fan of, of, of those wines and stylistically and, and the flavors of that. But I, I thought about it really, it's really the, the style I think of those wines to me was like the, so attractive and, and Gewurztraminer is probably the most interesting of all those varietals that I just mentioned just because of its 4,000% um, intensity of aroma and, uh, and character that the other most grapes have you know some fun flavors but Gewurztraminer is off the charts you know and so but it can be a little bit but it's you know it certainly can be all Gewurztraminer so you really need to kind of you know add other layers and kind of qualities to if you really want to make uh, um, something other than just that one note if you're so if you're trying to make a full jazz you know Quartet or whatever in this case, uh, I guess septet, you know, uh, sextet, I guess it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, you know, Gewurztraminer has an amazing uh, things to offer, but you know, Pinot Gris can um, the, the stone fruit and the the texture and some of the fruit you can get from Pinot Gris, uh, Pinot Blanc uh, is one of my favorite varietals. And when done correctly, it is um, has just amazing fruit so and you know things like and then there's a, a lot of other great white wines though and qualities that you can pull out of it and just so it depends on what you're working with so Sauvignon Blanc, Vignet, Chardonnay they're they all have something to contribute and so you have but you have to go through a series of kind of turn this up turn that turn that sound up turn and it's a it's a sound and editing you know that you have to go through by tr by checking all these different levels until you hit the right notes and then all of a sudden man listen to that and so then i come and show it to you i'm like steve what do you think and uh, steve what did you say when i brought that proposed anarchist blend to you what did you say um i i thought it was absolutely killer i mean i think i think the what was it 2015 when you first brought it in and we had uh, shannon gewurz and riesling co-ferment which for those that don't know, co-ferment is when you, a co-fermentation is when you take multiple, either varietals or it could be the same varietal from different blocks technically, but um, really we talk about it with, with um, multiple varietals that we will ferment together as one wine in the fermentation process. It's very tricky to do logistically because you have to want to pick the fruit at the same time. Um, and that's, so we, we, we do it if we can, but Patrick's gonna pick the fruit and make the call based on the flavors and the fruit at, at, at their height. So that's the more important thing so we can always blend it together later. But when we did that initially and he brought that sample, it was the coolest thing because I didn't know that much about dry Gewurz and I didn't know much about dry Riesling either. Um, so I thought it was, it was just, I, I was kind of blown away and it was just kind of like anarchy in a bottle. I mean, I think that's kind of totally the direction he was going with, when it was in his head. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I wanted to, I wanted to, to, to certainly surprise you if you look on paper and you, well, you taste the wine, I think, uh, and you'll be reminded of, of those types of wines from, as I said, from Alsatian and, 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 and style, which I think is quite attractive. But, the, but then you, when you look at it, you're like, oh my gosh, Vignes in there and Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc, that's, what are you doing, you know? And so um, that, my point is, is that you, you should uh, always, tradition is really nice, but sometimes you need to consider other uh, non-traditional approaches because you might have an amazing result as well.
Stuart, so Pat, what do you think? Well, Pat, and, and I was just kind of wanted to say, well, you, you just brought up the Viognier. So initially you did this co-fermentation uh, a few years ago with what with, with Steve mentioned, the Gewürztraminer and the Riesling, and Chenin Blanc was also in there. Then, you know, you bring in these other elements. So what, what role does uh, Vio or Viognier play in this, in this, whatever, this sextet as you, as you <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a, uh, it brings, of course, more uh, aromatics. Both Viognier and Gewürztraminer are among the most aromatic of varietals out there and in, in of all wine, white and red. And it, uh, but it also has a texture and it's a slightly different fruit profile from the Gewürz. So it adds one more layer. I, I, I think I used a reference the other day to someone else of the, of the of, I, I think of each of all these as flavors or aromas as being kind of a step as one of the stairs in this giant staircase. Ideally it would have a full, you know, complement of this, you know, um, of all these layers to the wine. And so I was trying to challenge your thinking of what would work together, but then also uh, challenge your, your palate and your nose to see how many of these different layers can you pull out? Can you taste the Sauvignon Blanc? Are you able to see, um, oh, the Chardonnay provides this. So the Chardonnay adds roundness, the Viognier adds some aroma and texture, the Sauvignon Blanc fruit and, and um, you know, angularity and kind of acidity. And then the Gewürztraminer adds all the, the uh, aromatics and interestingness, I think, to the wine. And so it's kind of this concert of aroma and flavors that, so, sorry, Stu, I was, I was going to jump in and say, um, so, you know, I, I was going to welcome everybody to use the chat function to chime in with any sort of things you're, you're smelling, you're tasting, all of that. Um, you know, as, as you notice, we're, we're kind of smelling and drinking and, and tasting and all of that throughout the whole thing. Um, so it's totally an open, and I mean, we started at noon too, so this is just a <laughs> long day now. Um, but, but uh, you know, have, have a have have a join in the chat and, and let us know what, what you're smelling. I mean, to me, the, the Gewurz is um, just got this really great kind of overwhelming sort of tropical uh, aromatic to it. You know, it, it, it jumbles in nicely, whereas the Viognier to me is more perfumey, a little more floral. Um, but uh, but yeah, so uh, that that's, that's what I'm enjoying. But I also like the acidity and the angularity from the Sauvignon Blanc where it kind of cuts through a little bit of that Viognier and the Shard as far as the texture and the roundness. Hey, and then Larry Kaiser uh, came in with a question. And uh, Larry, Larry's question to everybody was, what, is, what percentage is the Gewürztraminer? And so Patrick put six different grapes in here. Patrick, do you kind of want to walk us through the percentages uh, if you have it handy? Otherwise, I can do it. Yeah, so the um, it's fifty percent Gewürztraminer, and so uh, it's half Gewürz, and so it's pretty, pretty heavily tilted towards the Gewürz because I really like. But but as I said, you need I I felt like you needed a uh, I wanted a more than just the Gewürz, although I love the Gewürz, and so I wanted to put in um, Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris. And so both of those things are in there, twenty percent each of those uh, Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris. Is that right, Steve? Am I correct? Yeah, sorry, I, I was looking in the chat. Uh, we got we got Lindsay Whitlock in town and on the, right. uh, hi, on, on the thing here. So, hi, Lindsay. Uh, that's a former intern of ours. Uh, that uh, I guess she's back in California, which is awesome. So yep. I'm sorry, so, I, I was not paying attention to anything you were saying. Yeah, no, it's I was right. It says 50% conversion or 20% of each of both Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio, and Pinot Blanc, correct. and then 5% Sauvignon Blanc. That comes from over in Napa and Morgan Lee Vineyard, 3% Viognier. Good job, Stu. Uh, and uh, Katie's Corner Viognier into that. And uh, 2% Chardonnay. Um, so in this case, is down in um, Santa Barbara County, the Chardonnay is, is Courtney's Vineyard Chardonnay. So each one providing a little bit of a, you know, quality. So as you said, Chardonnay can be very strong. So I wanted some of that quality to it, but to get a little bit of roundness, 2%, uh, 3%. Of the uh, of the Viognier because the Viognier, like the Gewürztraminer, is muy fuerte, and so you don't need um, you just need a little bit to kind of bring out some of those qualities. And you got to shift it forward, and so now you see it all of a sudden. Now you're like, man, it's great, dude. What do you think? So well, it's like I, the salt. I, it's the ah, very nice. I mean, I love it because you know, Patrick, on on the Reds, you kind of step on the gas a little bit. Like you know, we had the conspiracy theory last week: rich, round 
brooding, kind of a furrowed brow um, thing. And then your uh, the the whites and the pink, pinks, I should say, crisp, lean, and light. And it's bright. I don't know what it's like uh, all around the world right now, but here in the Bay Area, it's, it is very, very toasty, 80, 80 plus degrees Fahrenheit. And opening up the the anarchist was a breath of fresh air. You know, it's 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 a you know it's a beautiful porch pounder, pool pounder. <laughs> not meant to be derogatory uh, because it is a summertime sipper. Um, Patrick, we have a question for you as well. Um, how your thinking or approach to this blend has changed over the vintages as you get to know it? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. Um, anonymous one out there. Um, it is, uh, it is uh, it certainly an aspect of it is logistics of the, the vineyards and the, the vintage. And so uh, somewhat, you know, style, stylistically, I'm still trying to kind of hold true to what um, I was hoping for in this wine, as I said, very much um, along the lines of what you would get if you had one of the finer wines, hopefully, and, and, and from Alsace. And so, but I wanted to challenge your understanding of what works together, um, as I said, because traditionally they've done um, more much in, over there, they would do, they would not be doing, they would not be adding Vignet and um, Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay and uh, because they don't grow that there. So they wouldn't be adding it to those wines. So, but when my point was that I can still achieve, I think of that same kind of style, but with different components, doing things in a non-traditional way, as I just poured into the mind anarchists all over my lap. Uh, it'll, it'll really aerate on your chest. <laughs> I mean, Patrick, Patrick, it is an anarchist wine. And, you know, and here we are, we, you know, we work in Napa Valley, which, you know, was noted for blazing trails. And, but also some people think that, you know, Napa has kind of moved a little more traditional. And so here's a, a, a breath of refreshing air uh, coming in from the south end of Napa with new, with new approaches to winemaking. I, I, I applaud you for it. Um, and it's not just because I work with you. We, we also have one more uh, question from, from Kathy in Albuquerque asking uh, where the Gewurz was grown. So uh, Stu, you wanna, you wanna talk about where the Gewurz is from? Yeah, so what, what's old is new. So there's, there's a, a, a region in Northern California called Clarksburg. And when you take the last train to Clarksburg, uh, what happens is, uh, monkeys reference, um, Clarksburg was noted for a long time because they've been, they've been planting, the vines have been planted there for, for over 100 years because it was kind of near the Sacramento Delta. And so a lot of Italian immigrants went there during um, the post gold rush and started planting. But through the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, although they had these really amazing grape varietals there, they had huge yields. And so with the high quantity, you can get less concentration of flavor. So your quality kind of diminishes. And then about a decade ago, some of the cool kids on the block said, hey, if we kind of start reducing the yields, we could play with grapes that we can't grow in Napa, uh, we can't grow in Sonoma. And so we went out there, because I guess we're the cool kids on the block, and, uh, and found this Gewurztraminer, we found Riesling, found other varietals that we just can't grow. And so Clarksburg, you should definitely check it out. And it's an area that now is really coming back into vogue um, because of the unique grapes and the quality that is now coming off those vines. And the Pinot Gris, by the way, the Pinot Gris was also from um, Clarksburg as well. So of the six of those, two of those, 70% uh, of the wine is from Clarksburg. And so um, if it was another 15%, we would have we been able to call it Clarksburg as opposed to California. It has to be 85% from any one region, so. Um, and and that, that's, that's something that uh, kind of speaking to the brand, I mean, uh, we're going to kind of bring Jenny in here in a second, but talking about how you always want to, w with the Anarchist Wine Co. brand, we've tried to really um, center everything back to our original intent, which was to, to really honor, honor those in society and history that have, that have bucked convention, had a different idea, and, and somehow had a positive uh, impact on society. And so uh, in, in true spirit to that, 
instead of adding another 15% to be able to do it to Clarksburg, which actually from a, from a marketing perspective and a sales perspective, some, some generations are very traditional and want to see Napa Valley on the label or Sonoma County on the Sonoma coast on the label or, you know, Santa Barbara County or something like that. But with this, we wanted to make the best wine possible. And the wine was not better with 15% more wine from Clarksburg. It was better with the Sauvignon Blanc that we grow in Yonville to take that feel. So, um, so that's, that's really the mission is to, is to try to do that. And so to, to that vein, um, you know, Patrick had created this wine that, that, you know, really spoke to changing minds and, and, and bucking convention. And we needed a label and packaging that, that stood up to it. So, uh, Stu, would you, would you bring Jenny on the screen? Do you mind? Yes. I, I'm I know, I know I'm sure my you fingers mind. and, uh, hopefully Jenny Dow will appear here. Um, and wow, <laughs> it just like magic, uh, 21st century. She appears century as magic. if from nowhere. Yes. Uh, what, you know, it, like David Blaine, uh, <laughs> or insert your favorite. I was about to say comedian, but magician would be the welcome to Jenny. Go. Hi. So, so just to, as a matter of introduction, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and introduce Jenny. So Jenny is our creative director and, uh, and our, also our graphic designer. She handles uh, all the labels at the Wine Foundry um, for basically 300 different bottlings a year. And she handles other stuff for outside clients, but we don't need to talk about them. And she does everything for anarchists and everything for Foundry and uh, is, is kind of our guiding voice. She's also vying for the lead with Stu and, and kindest people in, in, the, in the planet. Um, aw. And um, so anyway, Jenny Dahl. So Jenny, thanks for joining us. And um, we're I'm hoping, I'm sure you've been listening, but hoping you can kind of take everybody through kind of the packaging, a few thoughts on, on why we package it the way we did, what we did, and, um, and, and kind of the, just the anarchist lineup as a whole. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, okay, the design process. Um, the design crew uh, is Val, Steve, and Stu. Um, you know, they came to me and said, we need a brand. And so we met, powwow, two around ideas. I went away, did my thing, came up with some ideas that were a little bit more traditional. But then I had this idea like, hmm, maybe we could do something super crazy and have the labels be generative art. Did some research, found this amazing artist, Keith Peters. And um, I presented it to everybody and said, what if we like used everybody's data from our list of anarchists from Jacques Cousteau, Galileo, Madame Curry, um, and we used their data, their death dates, their birth dates, and their date of significant contributions, gave the data to Keith. He created just mind blowing art. And that's in a nutshell, how we came to, uh, the labels that you see on the Yeah. Board. Well, Jen, Jenny was instrument. She, she came to us with this idea because we were kind of stumped. Val and Stu and I met, uh, many times to try to figure out how to, convey this, you know, kind of mission of wanting to acknowledge these, these people or these dates and events. And, um, and, and Jenny really had this kind of epiphany one day about generative art and then found Keith. And then we totally all just jumped in the rabbit hole with her. So I think, I think Stu's going to show you a little bit of the generative art screenshots of, uh, of some other versions of things that Keith had done for us. So, um, and, and there's all sorts of different ways you can do this stuff, right, Jenny? Yeah, yeah. So, um, oh my gosh, they were wonderful. What, can we, what is generative art? What it's, is it? It's art created from code. So it's numbers and it gets thrown in there. And then there's like wander points. Keith would send me emails. I'd have to like turn it out like three times the size, turn on all the lights, put on my reading glasses, read it out loud because I, it was mind blowing. I, I had to like try to understand what it meant that we were doing. I learned a lot. So- Stu, will you show one of your screen shares while-, uh, while Yeah, doing so, that? yeah. So- I'm Sorry, this, Jenny, go ahead. Oh no, it's okay. On this particular one, I came in and I was working with black and white and red with Keith. And then Val was like, no, it looks like bullet holes, gunshots. And so um, it was great to, uh, to play. 
and uh, work on some other different color schemes. And then I gave the numbers to Keith and he integrated them. And uh, if you bring the press proof back, back up, Stu. Absolutely. That last one, or not the last one, but the first one. Um, so this was the press proof. Uh, yeah, and you can see the colors just went all over the spectrum. So we came up with uh, uh, colors per the anarchist, the conspiracy theory, the philosopher, and what's not, oh, you can almost see rosé against the machine down at the bottom. And uh, based on how open or closed they are, the wander point had something to do with that. And so, that's how we got it. That's how it So happened. Lisa just asked us what, what a wander point is or wander value, right? So oh my gosh. The, the, okay, everybody needs to have their mind blown for a second because um, I yeah. hope I can explain can, it. Can, can, you, can you do it? <laughs> yeah, you can do it, you can do it. I don't know that I can anymore because it's been a while since I thought about it. And I've been thinking about things I, like, what am I gonna eat every day? Um, so it just had to do with with how the data processed and whether it went like wide open and created um, the really starry one, which is- So those are the same, yeah. those are the same dates, right? Yeah, those are the same data with different wander points. And um, yeah, that's what happens. And I think we, might, that, we might be able to get Keith on here one of these weeks as well. Maybe he's so. there right now and he can chime in in the chat and be a little bit more clear on it but i don't know if he's here or not but anyway um i'll have a better answer for you next week <laughs> i think I, I mean you did a good job descript describing it playing with an algorithm putting yeah. in data and so an untra you know like steve said an untraditional approach like patrick's fermentations patrick's blends a different approach to labeling yeah. and paying homage to the people who over time really made great change in our culture and the way that people saw the world from being flat to round, you know? Yeah. And so, so like, Oh, go ahead, Jenny. Sorry. It's okay. Go ahead, Steve. No, I was just going to say that. So, so it's all, it's all dates that we've done on most of the wines. The conspiracy theory that we went through last week is actually latitudes and longitudes of different conspiracy theories. Right. So like the grassy knoll and Paramount studios and uh, things such as that. Um, one of these days we're gonna we're gonna have to create a little info guide or something and, and reveal our secrets but we've always kind of wanted to be a little dodgy with that um jenny can you talk a little bit about the uh the rest of the packaging uh the, either the cork or the okay. you know the capsule or lack thereof so we've got the manifesto on the cork and we have no capsules because we have to we're breaking with tradition and plus it looks really nice to see the manifesto through uh, the bottle and then they all have the end brand too so we don't have vintages on the corks either there we go and uh, yeah and the lock and key can you can you explain what the lock and key is if Stuart oh, gives yeah. us a visual aid well of course the anarchist uh, icon that we all know is a circle with an A busting out of it so I just took that motif and just kind of cleaned it up so it didn't feel like um, gas mask and Molotov cocktail, right? So we have, um, and that's what the circle is. It's paying homage and then just, you know, taking it to the next step, <clears throat> following the iconography of anarchy. All right, and the last one I thought of is um, down the side of the label, there is a- oh, right. Yes. Uh, there are four, four, four kind of statements. The, the, the question, the situation, or the situation, the question, the action, and the outcome. Right. Can you speak to that a little bit? And each of the different, um, so the anarchist has one, one of part of that highlighted. The philosopher has another. So we, we highlighted that, uh, I'm sorry, of that, those four words, the one that's bolded is appropriate per the name of the label. So that's the anarchist and it's the action, right? Because anarchy is kind of verb. Yeah, and so there's always, there's always, 
essentially there was a situation that caused somebody to ask a question that took an action and then there was an outcome, right? And so that that's really kind of the progression of why these thinkers or doers or movers and shakers or however you want to break it through. Um, disruptors, that's a term we try to stay away from because Stu says it's way too overused around Silicon Valley. So um, yeah, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's exactly kind of all of those things apply. And so that's what that is on the label. Um, and, and so for those of you on this webinar are probably the only ones that get it, but thanks for getting it after us explaining it to you. One, one last question um, that I'm actually gonna throw to uh, Patrick real quick. Um, Bill in Greenbrae is asking if future vintages of the anarchist are centered around Gilbert Streminer or is that, is that your plan to continue doing that? Um, it is the plan at the moment, and so because I've um, been so happy with the uh, the results, you know, the 19 is even more uh, than I'll I'll spill the secret. It's even a little bit more than 50 percent conversion meter, and so um, it's uh, I, I think it's I think it's so fun to work with, and we actually the skeptic this year, um, which we'll be bottling next week, or this year meaning 2019 vintage, of course, is what I meant the. Um, the last vintage, the current year of, of grapes for me. And so this, they, we, did, we did some of the Gerberstraminer on the skins as an orange wine. And so that will be bottled next week. And I'm super excited about that. But the uh, but Gerberstraminer, yes, for the, for the short term at least, yes, we will continue to do as we've done because I hope that Bill uh, and, and other people agree that it's a, it's a super tasty combo. And so why would you mess with a good thing? So now we might, we might adjust levels up and down depending on what we have to work with. And so uh, it's, it's all, um, you don't just keep a recipe, you know, you need to add more salt, you need to add more salt. So in the years when we had to change it up a little bit, I, I do, but if, if not, then we keep it very similar. So. All right, well, thank you. And, and so I'm gonna, uh, we, we have a, uh, uh, one other um, question here, um, and let's see. Uh, oh, what, where did it go? So I don't know. You got uh, it, Stu? Yeah, I do. It says uh, it's from an anonymous person, um, or their name might be anonymous attendee. Um, the art is really cool. Hi, the art is really cool. Are you going to sell the art as well? Oh. We, we'll, sell called, we'll, sell, we'll sell it on coasters. We'll we'll sell it on coasters, and uh, and that's going to be what we're going to refer to as chateau cash flow in the future, right? So, um, so hey, yeah, we, we we may we may yeah talk to Keith, and we can have some G clay. Yep, prints made up, and it's on our. We have it on T-shirts and uh, and maybe some apparel forthcoming. Uh, if you have any, have any more notes about the anarchist that you want to chime in with aromatics, flavors, what you're getting, what you want to drink it with, feel free to chime it in on the chat function. And then I think we're going to take, we're going to step away from white wine and move toward red. And, and we can keep Jenny on the screen here. Um, sure. And, and, and then down the road, if anybody has, maybe Jenny can pay attention to the chat as well. If anybody has any specific questions for her. She can also, I believe, see the Q&A. Um, and uh, um, so, yeah, but and then, and then let's get into the crucible. So, uh, Stu, do you want, should I just go ahead and jump in? Go for it, man. So the, the I'm not sure if I mentioned this in, in the little few minutes before everybody else came on when it was just the four of us or not, or if it was when everybody was live, but, uh, the cool thing about this is that both of these wines tonight are the very first wines we made for each of these brands. So um, it's very important to all of us um, and, and, and our team at the winery or scattered all about the Bay Area at the moment, but a lot of people at the winery. And um, so it's, it's very, it's very uh, near and dear to us. You know, we've, we've worked very hard. We work very closely with each other and, uh, and right now, especially we miss each other quite a bit. Um, you know, I haven't, I don't think I've, I, I saw Philip, uh, one of the owners of the winery. I saw him for the first time today in, in seven weeks in person. Um, so that was kind of wild, but it's, the great thing about this is, is the crucible moving to the red wine um, is the first wine we did for any brand 
Um, we made this when our winery was, we were renting a little space at a facility in Sonoma. Um, and this is the 2013. We started, founded, founded the Wine Foundry in 2012, um, about, I don't know, two weeks before Patrick's first pick call of the 2012 vintage on the Sauvignon Blanc that year. And um, so the, the 2013 Crucible is a right bank inspired blend. The Crucible is a name that, uh, a Crucible is something that's used in a foundry. So when we came up with the name, the Wine Foundry, which actually Stu, he, he should be credited uh, for this, I believe, if I remember correctly, um, the, the Wine Foundry, uh, or a foundry is where metals are made, and uh, essentially. And so the Crucible is where you would pour in the, the molten metal stuff. And so we kind of loosely turned it into the wine foundry. So a foundry is just where things are made, in this case, wine. And the Crucible was our first name for it. And we're, we're very proud of this wine. It, it obviously has a special place in our hearts. And um, it's, our, it's our kind of new world take on an old world style. So uh, to that end, I, I'm going to pass it over to Patrick to provide a little bit of color about what we mean when we say old world and new world and, uh, and take it from there. Mr. Sabo. Yeah, are you, are you old school or new school? Which one are you? I'm all school. Oh, all school. So old world, you know, certainly when they're talking old world, they mean, um, most people mean uh, Europe in general, but um, in particular France, you know, so the French have taken over ownership of certainly of, uh, in cuisine and in wine over the years, I certainly think that they have mastered the, and most of the varieties and the traditions that we do in the winemaking world particularly go back in the, in the modern times to French techniques and traditions. And so in general, in the old world, you know, they, um, um, it depends on where the, which part of the old world you're referring to. So in the case of the of Bordeaux, you have, you have areas of Bordeaux, the left bank, the west side of Bordeaux that is focused on Cab, Cabernet Sauvignon uh, dominant varietals. And in the east side of the, of the, uh, of the rivers, is the uh, right bank, if you will, and that's where they go more Merlot and Cabernet Franc and 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 such, and so less Cabernet. And so they they kind of grown over the years, and and tradition and rules have been set up that you, if you want to have the certain titles and and uh, stamps of approval of, of the government and this particular body, you need to do these things and plant these varieties. And so old world is very very much. Um, kind of you you have limitations on what you can do and in the stylistically old world generally the the lines of if you were a painter I, I'm not hopefully I'm doing this correctly but it's more of an impressionist and then not nearly as the lines are, are less um, clean and defined and more kind of blurry and so in my in my head so the, the flavors and um, are earthier and usually are a bit more complex in the old world wines but the fruit um, and the dominance of fruit and, and oak being part of the wines are a little bit more restrained than those elements. And so the new world thinks that a touch more weight and um, extraction and power is a little bit more um, yummy. I think the correct term is. And uh, that's, a tech, that's a technical term. <laughs> is. And the new world fans in general, again, these are, these are pretty much, you know, it's like, every, like everything, zero generalizations, but in general, new world fans prefer a little bit more fruit, a little bit more, perhaps a little bit more alcohol as well, and more ripeness in general. And so the wines from a new world, but, but aside from the ripeness aspect of a new world, it doesn't necessarily have to follow the same um, guidelines that the old world did because the new world can do whatever the new world uh, would like. And so they can, you're really limited by more on, um, um, market driven type things. If, if you do well, then, then you can, then people will applaud what you've done, even if you did it uh, um, non-traditionally. And so anyhow, um, new world uh, is you do, you could be somewhere around, you could prefer both of those things. You don't have to one, one or the other, you can might be somewhere in the middle. You might sometimes want this, sometimes want that. It's not a uh, black and white, but the, um, if you definitely, Stu, you, are you, you've been in the, on Bordeaux, you've been to Bordeaux. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, and look, I am a fan of both sides, uh, uh, both banks, basically. I mean, I love Cabernet Sauvignon, but, but, but I think what was great about this was 
in, in a time when Merlot was not resonating in, I, and I hate, kind of hate the new world, old world designations, but look, um, you know, after the movie Sideways came out, Merlot was a, uh, was a curse word for many people. And sales plummeted by upwards of 30% just because of a movie. And I might have benefited from that because I was a, you know, a, a Pino person at, at the right time. But, uh, but it was un that grape was unfairly maligned. And so I think we had the choice with this wine whether to put Merlot at, on, the na on the bottle, right? And uh, so... It, it was also, I mean, aside from the movie, though, too, one, one bit was the Merlot was so overplanted in California. And so that was that was a lot of your base for just a lot of Schleck kind of wine, just really poor quality stuff. No. Well, I mean, it was it kind of became ubiquitous, but the grape itself is beautiful. <clears throat> the, the grape itself is beautiful. And I and and look, the movie changed economics of wine, you know, uh, un unfairly, I would say. I mean, and look, we chose not to put Merlot on the bottle because, because we didn't, you know, I think it was a conscious decision that would, would the reaction be bad? And so we came up with this fanciful name, Crucible, which has really resonated. And Patrick, on for this one, you went 94% Merlot to really spotlight the beauty of the grape, 3% Cab Franc, and then uh, 3%, well, we would say in the industry, PV, but Petite Verdot. What do each of those grapes kind of bring to the plate? Yeah, the, and these are, um, this is entirely a right bank wine in this case, right bank in this case of Napa. And so, um, the, and the Vaca range that runs along the East Coast, and the Broken Rock Merlot is the, uh, the Cab Franc is from at the top of the hill from that Merlot stagecoach as is the Petit Verdot, which is up from Stagecoach. And so they're literally all right there on that same road. This whole wine is from, um, from, that, from that area. And so it, it, um, Merlot adds, in this case, Merlot, Broken Rock Merlot is, uh, it is not the soft, I think, lush Valley Floor Merlot. It's a little bit more of a Merlot with a uppercut, you know. And so um, the Cabernet Franc actually restrains the Merlot and uh, the Petit Verdot adds the back end. And so Cabernet Franc is beautiful from Stagecoach. It adds aromatics and, and kind of and brings more layers to it. The Petit Verdot though completes the, the finish on the, uh, on the palate. And uh, so you get this um, um, earth and, and structure and weight from the Merlot and the, the delicacy and aromatics from the, P, from the Cap Franc. And then the, the back end um, and the overall kind of roughness from the PV. And so uh, together, I think you add a nice, it, it makes for a new world right bank. And so it's not an old world right bank. And this would, this is a little too, um, it's a little too big, I think, for the old world to say this was a right bank. You know, so this would, they would think of this as almost like Cabernet re reflection. So this would, you know, so, but for someone that can appreciate that both uh, have a foot on both sides, I think of the, of the argument, you could see what I was trying to do with the Merlot and the, but also see how the, the new world in Napa brings in that, that, I mean, this wine will be in two or three, four or five years, will still be, um, I think, ready to drink. And so uh, it's got a lot, it's got a way to go. That's why you kept mentioning to open it early. So, and Patrick mentioned a few things. He tossed out some terms. He said something called stagecoach. He said something called broken rock. So those are the names of some lauded vineyards inside uh, Napa Valley. And on the east, both of them are on the east side of Napa Valley on that mountain range called the Vaca Range. Broken Rock is kind of at the base of, uh, it's kind of on the bench land, so it's Benchland. off the valley floor. And then if you continue on the same street, which is off Silverado Trail, for those of you who've been to Napa, you climb a road called Soda Canyon Road and when you go past Broken Rock, then you keep driving, then you keep driving, and then you keep driving, and eventually you'll eventually come to Stagecoach Vineyard, which is uh, where we're really excited because we'll be speaking with the person who enabled Stagecoach Vineyard to, uh, to, to launch. That'll be next week, Jan Krupp. 
So Stagecoach, Broken Rock, these are different vineyards which go into this wine. Hey Stu, uh, I see a question out there about food pairing for this wine. What do you, what do you have any, what do you, so, what do you think? Yeah, you're, it's, it's a really good question. So, you know, and, and some of you who know me know that I am kind of the anti-food pairing person because I think each person has their own palate. And depending on the time of day, the song you just heard, the person who cut you off in the car, those can all kind of shape things. That said, for the Crucible, because I have a bottle open and I have uh, some stuff that I can smell cooking about 15 feet away, tonight uh, I am going to be having a, uh, a little petite filet wrapped in something called bacon. I don't know if you're familiar with this substance, but, uh, but I think, you know, kind of bigger, heartier dishes, um, but it can stand if, if, if you eat fish, an oily fish like salmon, well seasoned, it can stand, it can stand up to that. I see another question in about uh, the fires and the, um, you know, and some vineyards with fires. What are, are do, Steve, what do you I mean? Anything happen to the vineyards uh, during the fires? No, actually the vineyard, let me make, I'm not on mute, right? Uh, the vineyards, what we realized in 2017 that I don't know that people really totally grasped at the time was that vineyards are a natural fire break. So uh, what really is, is more the concern during that time is smoke taint on the grapes. Uh, in 2017, as, as you'll see, we'll get into our 2017s in the fall, we're gonna be uh, releasing our 2017 The Philosopher. And, uh, and we, also, we currently have our 2017 Rage Against the Machine red wine. But we were fortunate enough to pick everything except for one block of fruit prior to the fires in 2017. Uh, and that block we ended up not picking and, and left on the vines. Um, however, uh, so, you, so yeah, so the, the very, very few vineyards were uh, burned. If anything, it was singed along the edge. You know, you could drive through it. Everything else around it would be burned. On a, very on tragic. A sad, on yeah, a Patrick, sad. go for it. Yeah, on a sad note, the owner of that Broken Rock Vineyard, his house was one that did burn. And so mm -hmm. his burn- Which his is house, on the vineyard. This is right next to the vineyard. And as Steve mentioned, the vineyard, you know, a fire hits a vineyard, there's nothing under a vine really to burn. So there's not, so it doesn't, it just stops, you know, but everything around the vineyard, including the trees, including the houses, including the, the tractors or the picking bins or anything else that will, it's flammable, will certainly burn. But the vineyard, uh, fire hits the vineyard and it just goes out, you know? So if the, uh, I, I, I've called it a natural fire, but it's probably technically unnatural even that vineyards aren't quote unquote natural, you know, and that Steve. Uh, <laughs> I got the that way, from you. The way the fires kind of took place in that year, it, it was really fascinating. So that is, there was, that was called, that area was called the Atlas fire. And as Patrick mentioned, Bill, uh, I'm not going to mention his last name, but the owner of the vineyard, his home burned literally next door. And he had, he had a clearing around his house. Literally next door, there's this giant tree uh, kind of engulfing an entire house. And that house unscathed entirely. And yet the car in the driveway was melted in place and then all you saw was all you saw were chimneys all around but then this random house under the most like the largest tree imaginable trees fine house is fine everything else scorched earth policy um it just kind of jump 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 you know, you know we were we were very fortunate to pick the uh, broken rock cabernet oh, that year two, two days? days or friday we picked it on friday and the fire was sunday night to monday morning yeah h coach we picked a day before and then George III, we picked the morning of. It was really very fortunate in 2070. This is the, uh, but we're, we're going back further and this was 2013 vintage for the Merlot. And so, um, yeah. And many people actually jumping onto that vintage, many people felt the 2013 vintage at the time, like people were saying best vintage ever, right? Mm -hmm. And then we've just had these remarkable string of uh, amazing vintages. So yeah, it's, it, it's, 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 it's a joke because every year when I'm working with people who make wine with us, oh, it's like 2012, best vintage, 2013, 2000. It's this, it's 
becoming kind of a joke that all the vintages have been lining up uh, in terms of the quality of fruit, exceptional, exceptional. So to that end, I'm gonna go ahead and, and let folks know that we're, we're a few minutes before six o'clock. We wanna be respectful of everybody's time and, and really appreciate you joining us on your Friday evening. And to let you know that the, the four of us will be happy to stay on here. Well, I, I can't speak for Jenny, but I think so, unless she has a yoga class. Okay, so the four of us are happy to stay on here and uh, answer any questions, or maybe the four of us will just end up drinking together for a while. But um, give, you a, give you a heads up on a few things coming up uh, next week, which I think uh, tomorrow you'll probably get in, a note in your inbox. We have our next uh, two-part uh, series tasting. It's called Fatal Attraction, How Cabernet Sauvignon Was Born. Um, it's a torrid love affair between two star-crossed vines that came together and birthed this magical being that we know as Cabernet Sauvignon. So uh, it's going to be interesting. There's going to be great copy that, that was written, or there is great copy that was written that'll be in your inbox for that. Um, the wines are up on our website if you're interested in joining in for that. You can either do the four pack, which includes ground shipping. Um, and, and these are foundry wines. They're, the whole series is foundry. It's a Sauvignon Blanc, a Cabernet Franc, and two different Cabernet Sauvignon. And uh, they are heavily discounted. So um, especially for the wine club members, you may even want to buy like 10 of them because it's, it's a flip and steal. Um, however, those are four packs as well as next week's two pack are up on the website. Um, now, and so you can do that. Club members, make sure you log in uh, to do that and, and you'll see your discount there. Uh, if you have any questions about it or any trouble, please send a note to taste at anarchistwineco.com and uh, one of us uh, will, will answer the call. Um, our, speaking of the wine club, actually, uh, the 2013 Crucible that we've been enjoying tonight, these are Literally, I think I broke into the very last case uh, to, to grab a bottle for Patrick to go home with today from the winery and, and as well as for me. Um, 2014 is released. It's coming out to the wine club first. They're all going to be receiving it next week. That club is still open. If anybody's interested in it and, and learning about the benefits, you can find it on our website, anarchistwineco.com, and you'll see the club tab up there. And tomorrow, if anybody didn't have the wines or, or wants to rewatch this, you'll, you'll also have a link for this recording in your, in your email. Uh, I want to give a shout out that Stu mentioned earlier. So on Wednesdays, we do something called Wine Foundry Wednesdays. And I know some of you definitely join us for that. It's more geared towards the winemaking and viticulture side of things. Sometimes we geek out a little bit. Uh, Wednesday will be very cool because we'll have Jan Krupp, the, the founder of Stagecoach Vineyard, and he'll be telling the history and story of Stagecoach Vineyard. He no longer owns the vineyard. He sold it uh, about three years ago. Um, but he, it's a fascinating story about basically taking this arid land that nobody could find water in. And it involves literally a water witch coming in, finding the water, telling him how far to dig, how deep to dig to find the well. And it's now arguably top 10 vineyard in the world. It's definitely top three or four vineyard in, in California or in the new world, I should say, in, in the Americas. Um, so, that, so that would be a lot of fun. Anyhow, feel free to drop off the line anytime. And thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you all supporting our brand and, and chiming in with your, with your great questions and comments and positivity. It's really fun to see everybody and, and cheers and we'll stay on as long as you'd like. Thanks so much. Cheers. Oh, still we forgot.